coronavirus in Iowa. One year ago, the first COVID-19 cases reported in Iowa. What a year it's been. Lost lives, lost jobs, lost time. But also moments of hope, opportunities to learn. Tonight, how the state managed the crisis in those early days. Really, you know, our number one priority from the beginning was to protect the health and safety of Iowans, especially our most vulnerable. What went right and what had to change? The pandemic has highlighted in a in a really tremendous way the fractures that we have in our health care delivery system and something you haven't ever seen. We're taking you to corners of the hardest hit county in Iowa, the lessons leaders learned and where they go from here. Coronavirus cause and effect Iowa impact episode one. You're watching local five news. Good evening. We've called it the new normal for so long, but it's now become the permanent state of our lives. Wearing masks, social distancing, many of us still working from home. We're all juggling new responsibilities. It's hard to know what normal even is anymore. Coronavirus is now a part of our lives and it's taken the lives of so many Iowans. Tonight, we're starting this episode with a look back at how we got here. The potentially deadly coronavirus is on the rise in the U.S. January 21st, 2020, the first coronavirus case reported in Washington state. Officials first confirmed a patient in Seattle was hospitalized after returning from Wuhan, China, the epicenter of the outbreak. Three days later, COVID-19 to the east in Illinois. She had cold-like symptoms, shortness of breath, uh, fever. On March 6th, another neighbor to Iowa reports its first case. Nebraska now has the virus. A day later, March 7th, Governor Kim Reynolds orders partial activation of the State Emergency Operations Center because of the virus. We will be notifying state agency partners later today to report to the State Emergency Operations Center tomorrow morning. The very next day, Sunday, March 8th, the first three cases of coronavirus in Iowa become public. While this news is concerning, it's not cause for alarm. Days later, colleges begin to shut down. By March 11th, all three of Iowa's public universities move classes online. The same day, the World Health Organization characterizes COVID-19 as a pandemic. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Less than a week after the first case is reported in Iowa and Governor Reynolds announces there's community spread in the state. We've seen this continue to spread. We have new counties added to our list of affected counties almost every day. And the next day, the governor and her administration recommend but do not mandate schools close for four weeks. On March 16th, the state legislature closes down mid-session. Tuesday, March 17th is when the shutdown begins. You have a role to play in helping us mitigate the spread and to bend the curve. Bars and restaurants banned from dine-in service. Gyms close. Senior centers close. Visitors not allowed inside long-term care facilities. Being diff it's difficult and it's difficult for anyone, any of us who are quarantined. A week later, March 24th, the first COVID-19 related death is reported in Dubuque County. That same week, Governor Reynolds orders clothing stores, retail, salons and other businesses to shut down. I had roughly $4,000 of income just negated. Non-essential surgeries stop in hospitals and doctor's offices. April 2020 begins with grim news about unemployment. April 2nd, we learned the unemployment rate in Iowa sees its largest one week spike in state history. I'm used to getting paid every day, not, you know, no money for four weeks. On April 7th, Governor Reynolds and the state public health department introduce regional medical center data, and we all quickly become obsessed with tracking cases and hospitalizations and ventilators. The plan is to transition into more modeling and forecasting. Throughout the month of April, the governor's daily press conference gave us information about COVID-19 outbreaks and long-term care facilities. On April 10th, a startling directive from state public health leaders. The order requires all providers to work with our department to further assess, monitor, and extend the use of the supply of PPE in our state. Everyone was looking for personal protective equipment. 
In mid-April, another alarming headline, coronavirus sweeping through meatpacking plants in our state. More and more people start testing positive for COVID-19 at the Waterloo plant. Then on April 17th, Governor Kim Reynolds and the head of the Department of Education announce all schools must close for in-person learning for the rest of the year. Closing schools through the end of the year is not an easy decision and we do know the challenges this creates. April 21st, Test Iowa is launched, a state-run website allowing eligible Iowans to book a COVID-19 test appointment free of charge. The rollout is shaky and many have issues with test availability and access. They said that I was going to have results in 72 hours, but they still haven't gotten them back. About a month after announcing major closures, Governor Reynolds tells Iowans about the first steps to reopen the state, with farmers markets and elective surgeries getting the green light. From then on, there was no appetite from the state leadership to turn back. The message was Iowa is moving forward and working to get back to normal, whatever that was. It's not sustainable for us to continue to lock the state down. We need to start to open it up in a responsible manner. Even as more outbreaks at manufacturing plants, meat packing plants and nursing homes were reported, even as more Iowans died and thousands more infected. Intermittent closures were put in place. The fall of 2020 was arguably the worst for the pandemic in Iowa. Hospitals at capacity. Still stressed, We've st we're still in our surge uh, plan um, and planning for more. People were dying from the virus at a higher rate than ever before. Then on November 16th, Governor Kim Reynolds addressed Iowans in a prime time speech. New closures for bars, restaurants and other indoor venues, limited gatherings and a limited statewide mask mandate. When you're in an indoor public space and unable to social, social distance for 15 minutes or longer, masks are required to be worn. No one wants to do this. Uh, I don't want to do this, especially as we're coming into a holiday season that is normally filled with joy. Most Iowans listened and cases began to go down. And as 2020 ended, another announcement to give us all some hope. We are coming on the air right now with some breaking news. The FDA has just issued an emergency use authorization order for Pfizer's vaccine. Moderna is shipping out nearly 6 million doses of its vaccine just 36 hours after the FDA issued emergency use authorization. Pretty remarkable to look back at all of that. The pandemic tested all of us, but especially Iowa's leadership. They were required to make smart decisions to protect us. Local 5 Chief Political Correspondent Rachel Droz sits down with Governor Kim Reynolds to take a look back, take a look back at the wins and the losses of the last year. This past year, some would say, felt like an eternity. And one person who could likely agree we're joined with right now, Governor Kim Reynolds, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And now, if you could take us back to late February, early March 2020, we were really just sitting and waiting for our first positive test here. Did you feel we were ready for that? I don't know if you're ever ready for an unprecedented historic pandemic, but of course we had watched what was happening in New York and I actually was participating in governor's uh, calls uh, sometimes twice a week so we could kind of understand what was happening along the East Coast where they were experiencing significant outbreaks so we could be as prepared as possible. Uh, when it ultimately did hit the state of Iowa. So, you know, I'm not sure you can ever be prepared. And the thing with this pandemic is the information has changed so much over time. And so you have to be flexible and be able to adjust and move with it. And that's kind of been the story of the year. And you kind of alluded to this in this last answer, but in those early days, life was pretty scary. We didn't know how transmissible this virus was. We didn't know how deadly it was. So what was it like having to make these huge decisions with very, very little data. Yeah, and, and all projections were really awful. If you remember the early projections about how many cases they had anticipated that each state would get, the number of deaths, the number of beds and vents that you would need, and, and all of them were just off the charts. And so really, you know, our number one priority from the beginning was to protect the health and safety of Iowans, especially our most vulnerable, uh, and then to do everything that we could to preserve our healthcare resources. And so that was kind of the impetus of everything that we did. But early on, I mean, like every other governor across the state, we were unclear 
as to the number and the amount of PPE that we would have, let alone the testing that really was a game changer for us in the state of Iowa. And now hindsight of, his, of course is 2020, but is there anything that if you could do differently, you would? Yeah, so I get asked that question a lot, and you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but, but knowing what I know now, um, I probably would not have closed the schools. You know, we had our first three cases March 8th. We stood up the Seahawk. We brought all of the agencies or representatives out to the Seahawk so we could operate as a team and be really nimble. And uh, we started looking for PPE and, and trying to figure out a way to identify the number of um, ICU beds that we had and vents that we had in the state. So I want to take an opportunity to give a huge sh shout out to our healthcare system who just unprecedented collaboration and coordination uh, in, with a healthcare system that competes to really provide one healthcare system to Iowans. And now, as we sit here today, um, this virus has claimed the lives of more than 5,000 Iowans. Some of your critics will say that you haven't done enough to slow the spread and prevent people from dying. Do you feel that you've done enough? Well, I don't, history will decide that. We've done everything that we could. I have an incredible team that has spent every single day. We have so many state employees and just private sector partners, as well as just Iowans that have stepped up to do the right thing, that have worked around the clock, seven days a week. You know, we were three months out at the State Emergency Operations Center, and that was Monday through Friday. It was not unusual for, not me, just me, but my entire team to roll in at nine or 10. We did, you know, multiple meetings throughout the day. Um, you know, the testing, I'm really proud of. We were one of the few states early on that was able to find access to 540,000 tests. And we opened up the criteria, so we really had a good sense of where the community spread was happening so that we could, you know, um, let those individuals know in those counties your positivity rate was high, you should take extra precautions, be responsible, here's what you need to do uh, to help mitigate and to help you know, protect yourself uh, from, from the virus. So you know, every one death is one too many and it's heartbreaking and it's the unfortunate you know, piece of COVID-19, but every state has experienced you know, significant loss and I believe every governor did everything that they could to try to mitigate and manage that. And you know, that's, you do the best that you can and um, you know, people are a part of that. They need to be responsible. We have an elderly population and that's another unfortunate side of COVID-19. It's especially deadly for um, elderly Iowans, especially those that have underlying conditions. So, you know, we I just I just want to say thanks to Iowans and to an incredible state team of workers that have really worked really hard every single day to help serve Iowans through this pandemic. And what was the day that you realized that this was going to be a life changing event that you are making these decisions for? Well, I think we thought that from the beginning. I mean, you know, we were talking yesterday a little bit as we were kind of recapping the year. You know, we can remember, you know, we were calling every positive one. We were calling them back to see if they were recovered. At that point, you know, it was a, a cruise ship that had just came back. That really is where we're first uh, cases were identified from and just kind of the small numbers that we were working with and how that has changed over time. So I think you know, just watching what happened in New York and on, out, you know, in some of the eastern states early on, I think we recognized that this wasn't something that we needed to, you know, we needed to take seriously from the very beginning. And it's just been interesting to see the dynamics of how much it's changed. Don't wear a mask, do wear a mask. I mean, we were told at the beginning, don't. It's, it's more harmful to wear a mask. Uh, it won't help kids, children, because they'll be playing with it and touch. I mean, this is information that came in. That's evolved over time. Um, just, just a lot of information has evolved over time. So, um, we, I, but we took, we knew, I think, from the very beginning, this is, this was going to be serious. Governor Kim Reynolds now looking to 2021 as a year to bring back Iowa jobs and put vaccines into arms. Those two things, she says, are her focus now.
Welcome back. Woodbury County was one of the first counties in our state to report coronavirus among its residents. It's in a unique spot on the border of Nebraska. It has a packing plant population and also a large urban area. Local 5's Rachel Droz takes us to one of the hardest hit areas in our state. Three individuals from Johnson County have tested positive. 105 cases across the state, 1,000 positive cases. It's been a year. Total cases have surpassed 50,000. In just 12 months, a virus has taken so much. And Iowa has suffered its first death from so many. More than 1,000 Iowans have now died. Tonight, we take you to one spot in Iowa hit hardest early on. We got hit some of the hardest of, of anywhere. Woodbury County, 100 miles north of Omaha. When we got hit, it just came like a waterfall. Tyler Brock is the deputy director for the Siouxland District Health Department. It was a flood, and, and we were not... Frankly, we weren't ready. Data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows the Sioux City area is largely made up of blue collar workers employed at places like this Tyson plant located in Dakota City, just over the Nebraska border. Once it started in that population, we didn't feel like it was going to stop anytime real soon. Health officials say high community spread likely started in plants like this in late April. Tyson's Dakota City plant idled for six days to deep clean the facility and test all 4,300 of its employees. Hospitals around that time stretched thin. When you're learning a lot of what you're doing from a treatment standpoint from Facebook, COVID groups for physicians, learning what they think is working in uh, in New York at an ICU and hopefully trying to implement the same thing here. Unsure if the treatment they were giving was helping or hurting. A lot of it was really just uh, doing the best that you can. Dr. Larry Voles, chief medical officer at Mercy One Sulian Medical Center, says during their first surge in late April, early May, the hospital was a scary place to be. It's something that we've never had to experience really uh, in you know in recent recent years in medicine and, and certainly hope we don't have to experience that again. And the elderly and those with underlying conditions are most likely to get seriously ill or die from COVID. But Dr. Voles says many patients at that time didn't fit that description. When we were seeing, you know, a 48 year old, you know, Hispanic uh, male come in from a from the knee packing plant um, with, you know, in, in, you know, going on a ventilator, those were those were really scary times. If these young, healthy people are are getting sick from this, you know, what is this really going to end up being? Back then, personal protective equipment was in short supply. Doctors in this Iowa county competing with the rest of the world. Me and, and uh, one of my daughters driving to Home Depot and buying the N95s and face shields that they had because it was the only place that we could get them before the community brought them and filling up the back of my pickup truck with you know, painting masks because that's, we weren't sure we were going to have enough to get through. Data on the Siouxland District Health Department's website showing Woodbury County had 25 new positive cases reported the week of April 19th. A week later, there was 448 new cases. Another week, 667. We went from testing, you know, 10 to 20 people in the whole community every day to doing 400, 500 tests in a community testing clinic in one day. A global pandemic. We were not ready for that kind of volume. Unlike anything modern America has faced before. Turn towards me just a little bit. December 2020, Americans got the news we've been waiting for. The FDA approved both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for emergency use. News that hopefully means this pandemic will soon be behind us. Woodbury County now holding weekly vaccine clinics. Put your arm like that for me. It's something many hope will be the answer to getting life. It's amazing to me that we're still doing this a year later. Back on track. In Sioux City, Rachel Droz, Local 5 News, We Are Iowa. Our state leaders were forced to make very tough decisions at the beginning of the pandemic, and they continue to face issues today. One of the biggest players in keeping us all safe, Interim Public Health Director Kelly Garcia. She got the job just a few months into the pandemic. Rachel Droz again sits down with her tonight. When you came to Iowa in late 2019, did you ever think today, a year and a half later, you would be director of two departments and dealing with a global pandemic? Gracious, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been an incredibly challenging year. I mean, beyond words, never could have imagined that this is what I'd be doing. 
But at the same time, it's allowed me to understand the connection points between our two systems. The pandemic has highlighted in a, in a really tremendous way the fractures that we have in our healthcare delivery system. And so now we get to work on how to fix those. Looking back, is there anything you think that should have been done differently here in Iowa? I mean, certainly. I think in any, in any emergency response with hindsight, it's always 2020. You're going to look back and think, I wish I had done something different. Um, our real communications challenges, this, this insatiable desire to have information and information in real time while you're working to understand and things are constantly evolving, um, that has challenged even the best communication experts. Uh, and so I would go back and do things a little bit differently. I certainly would. And, and I think what, what I could say today is that we are taking those lessons learned every day and, again, trying to re-engineer the way we're communicating to make it easier to understand for Iowans so that they can take the actions they need to to protect themselves. Now tell me a few stories. Uh, anything pandemic response related, just something that sticks out that you were a part of. Sure. So I'll tell you the story that was the hardest for me. It was the day I closed um, visitation at our facilities. And it was right around a holiday. And I remember telling the parents of our families at Glenwood and Woodward that they wouldn't be able to see their loved ones. And I sobbed uncontrollably while doing it. It's making me a little bit teary while I'm telling you. To tell a parent, I had to do it on the foster care side as well. Um, and to tell a parent that they can't see their child, it's heartbreaking. Um, but it was the right thing to do at the time. We didn't know, I wanted our individuals to be safe. I wanted, and I had the obligation to protect it. And they understood ultimately, and we lifted it as soon as we could. And now we're making some really good progress on vaccinations. But that was something that was you know, deeply behind the scenes, um, but an unbelievably painful and, and very um, just, it deeply rocked me as an administrator and as a parent. Throughout the pandemic, many Iowans have made it a part of their daily routine to go online and check the latest COVID numbers, cases, hospitalizations, deaths. They're all used to make decisions. Tonight, Local 5's Holly Susselman shares how Iowa's COVID data is organized. Many changes have happened in the past year. The way we work, socialize, grocery shop, and more are completely different. But we're not the only ones that experience change. There wasn't always a dashboard to show COVID activity. I spoke with a state epidemiologist and a data analyst on these changes and what Iowans should know moving forward. The state confirmed the first three novel coronavirus cases on March 8th. Back then, Governor Reynolds' office would send out press releases detailing the age and county of residence for the positive individual. It wouldn't be until May that we would finally have a functioning dashboard for Iowans to see virus activity. And there's been a lot of evolution over the last two or three decades in how we communicate in general, right? Not just around public health or health topics. So I think this, this idea around the information that we need to share is an important one. And it's one that I think we're learning more about and about what are better ways to do it. Around July, data collectors discovered the state was backdating cases and deaths. This caused shifts in the data presented, and it wasn't until August 29th that the state confirmed their problems. They didn't have a way to move forward the positive that actually occurred on the day that it did. And, and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is going to completely shift what the data looks like. Backdating means the state attributes a positive test to the day the person tested positive. So if I was tested on December 10th, that's the date the state will assign my test to, not the day that I received my result. Because of the data change, the graphs all shifted and ended up looking smooth, closer to the graphs that we see today. Also in August, that large data dump of antigen tests, which kind of screwed with um, the positivity rates for 14 days but on the front end for the rest of us, it looked like they added in thousands and thousands of tests on one exact day. The November surge came and went. Iowa saw its highest number of hospitalizations, deaths, and cases. In December, changes were made in death reporting. And just over two weeks ago, the state no longer reports individual positives, only tests. Both Padati and Willett told me that while reporting 24-hour changes in data is good, Iowans should look at trending data like percent positivity, hospitalizations, and deaths to determine how safe their community is. We'll dive deeper on specific changes as the week continues. 
reporting in the studio, Holly Slosselman, Local 5 News, we are Iowa. Welcome back. Each night this week, we're also taking time to highlight the heroes of the pandemic. Tonight, we're focusing on grocery store clerks who, before the pandemic, were never considered frontline workers. But they soon became critical in the fight against COVID and keeping us all safe and sane. Local 5 photojournalist Eric Gooden profiles two workers at Fairway tonight. How are you today? Staying warm? <laughs> You're set to go. All right. You have a great day. My job duties is a cashier, and then I order some aisles, and then I work on the fast lanes, which are self checkouts here, but we call them our fast lanes for Fairway. Y'all ready to go? I'm ready. You're ready. Okay, so am I. I've worked here for two years, and then the pandemic hit. I was working that night, and all, we were busier than all get out, and I'm like, what's going on? And it was the pandemic hitting us. <laughs> I've started as produce manager just uh, this year. I stepped in right at the end of the summer, so I was used to handling some of it, but stepping into it was, uh, it was a big step. Being in produce, uh, we already have a lot of rules about sanitation, working with ready to eat product, staying six feet away from customers and from other employees, which uh, it's challenging because there's a lot of times where being in a small store like this and having so many people in it, but uh, we've been doing the best we can. We started wearing masks and sanitizing things that customers touch a lot, that we touch a lot. It was tough at first, a lot of new things. It seemed like came down every day, cleaning guidelines, safety guidelines, all that kind of stuff. But I feel our crew and our customers both really adapted. <laughs> Do you check your aches? It was hard to not even just give some customers a hug because some customers during all this pandemic, they just needed a hug sometimes and you couldn't hug them. I don't consider myself a hero or any of us a hero here. I just consider we're doing our job and we're doing it the best we can with the greatest customers we have. Finding everything all right? Perfect. I've definitely gotten used to it. Kind of feels like the new normal, but uh, I really do want to see it come to a close. Thank you. Have a good day. Welcome back. hy V, another major grocery store chain in Iowa, also felt the impacts of COVID. Local 5's Stephanie Angelson interviews their lead spokesperson about how the company navigated through the tough times and looks ahead to what 2021 might look like moving forward. We are joined now by Tina Potoff, head of the communication arms of hy V. And Tina, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Sure. Well, let's first start March 2020, when coronavirus was first reported in Iowa and things we saw start to shut down, how did hy V process all of the changing updates and, and all the closures that were going on? Sure, well, I think I probably have March 6th circled on my calendar as the date from 2020 that really kind of changed the industry, changed our world, changed the way people were living as well as the way people were shopping too. And when that, that started to happen, when we started to see this shift in, hey, this is a real thing, this is really a pandemic that we're going to be a part of, um, we had to take a lot of precautions we have never, never taken before. Even looking at a crisis communications manual, a lot of us in the industry have said we flipped to the back of the book and we only had a couple pages on pandemic on how to handle that. So we've really kind of rewritten history as well as, you know, how you communicate with customers, how you communicate with employees. And we know you had a lot to juggle those early days. So what was most important during that time? Was it employees health or keeping the shelves stocked? Yeah, it was really, it came down to safety. It came down to safety of our employees. It came down to safety of our customers. And if you might recall, there was a lot of conversation over, do you wear a mask, do not wear a mask? Um, is that something you should do? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And really what we encountered was, yeah, since we're in eight different states, um, everyone had their own jurisdiction over how they were handling that. And it became very difficult to try and figure out a way to abide by state and also local laws and ordinances that were being put into effect, as well as taking care of our customers and also our employees. Um, so immediately, you know, the first thing we knew we needed to do was really look at our sanitiz sanitization procedures. We were already a clean store, but we needed to take it up a notch in this level of the pandemic. And I think that's one of the things 
things that you're going to see even after this pandemic is over, which I know we all have our fingers crossed for, you know, 2022, that we can establish some type of sense of normalcy with the vaccines starting to come out. Um, but I really think you'll see the sanitization procedures from a retailer perspective stay at that same level because that's the expectation now, right, is to see people wiping things off, to see the carts being wiped off on a regular basis. Um, and that's really the first step that we took. And you mentioned people shopping differently. One of the first trends we saw out of the gate was that panic buying, uh, people hoarding certain things like toilet paper. That was a big one. We saw empty shelves and uh, aisles jammed with carts, people trying to get those supplies they felt like they needed right away. So what was it like working with that? Um, it was interesting to see people automatically go to toilet paper. You know, I think we thought that other things around the store would, uh, you know, be be taken um, first. And to see toilet paper really be the first thing to be taken was oh, quite interesting. Um, and so you've seen certain things really become, um, yeah, a, a little skewed um, that, that normally weren't skewed in the past. So how did hy improve the process to get food and all those things on the shelves? I would imagine that had to take a pivot as well. Right. So as me, immediately when we started finding out, um, you know, about the next steps that we wanted to take, we worked with our suppliers to essentially start stockpiling ourselves. Um, and that's something that I think um, actually worked in our favor because uh, a lot of people were just working with suppliers just to get, you know, what they needed on a regular basis. And even when we started to see that the supplies started to come back to a, a a normal level or somewhat normal level, we still said, hey, we want to go about, go ahead and stockpile these supplies. And so we did that in our warehouses. So we still have more toilet paper. We still had um, more, you know, I would say non-perishable items, soaps, things along those lines that we could continue to grab as, as much as possible. We also work with some suppliers that maybe we worked with just a little bit, but not, they weren't our major supplier, but we utilized them to, um, you know, to, to help us with getting those other um, supplies that people were really looking for. And anybody who has been in your stores has seen the presence of aisles online and the pickup programs that you have. A lot of people taking advantage of that. So how did that evolve and adapt with what we've been through with the pandemic? Yeah, that was really surprising for us because um, Isles Online, it was already a popular service, but we had kind of a core group of customers that were utilizing it. And what we saw is that its growth, um, it, it tripled, which was a five-year growth trend that we had for Isles Online within a matter of just a, a couple months. Um, so really we had to pick up our steam, start, you've probably seen in some of our locations, we've developed outside pickup areas, um, really revamp how we were doing that because our uh, number of people utilizing the program had quadrupled. A lot of changes we have seen over this last year. Tina, we want to thank you so much for your time today and also for everything you and your employees have done to, to keep this sense of grocery shopping normalcy going through an incredibly abnormal time. Thank you very much. Throughout the year, we've told you about the pandemic's impact on a lot of the popular bars and restaurants in the metro. But businesses like these face different challenges in rural Iowa. Local 5's Ryan Scott explains. 82% of restaurant owners in Iowa say their total sales volume this January was lower than January last year. That's according to latest data from the Iowa Restaurant Association. They say it's restaurants and bars in small towns across Iowa that were hit the hardest and have the most to lose. From complete shutdown. Not in our plan at all. To limited capacity. We keep it rocking right along. Restaurants and bars have gone through a lot in the last year, especially those mom and pop shops in rural areas. If this is all we had to rely on, we'd be really hurting. We would be really hurting. Tracy Beggar opened the 30 yard line in Grand Junction just months before the pandemic. Its location on US 30 made it a lightning rod for travelers when it opened, but it all ground to a halt. We officially opened mid January a year ago and then got shut down three months later. And though it's the only restaurant in town, business has never fully picked back up. We kind of cut back our staff to just a cook and a couple of owners come in and take the phone calls and do carry out orders. Including Tracy, eight owners share the burden of keeping the 30 yard line afloat. All eight of us have other full time jobs. And if they didn't, they wouldn't have any income. The big worry though is not really about the urban area. The big worry is the small town. Jessica Dunker with the Iowa Restaurant Association says once a small town restaurant like the 30 yard line closes, 
it can be difficult to find another restaurant to take its place. Rural Iowa has a dwindling population, and there isn't a compelling business reason for someone else to come in and try to backfill that space and open a restaurant. Thankfully, it hasn't been that bad for everyone. In the smaller communities, people have been very supportive of local businesses. Toby Cruz is the owner of the aptly named Toby K's Hideaway in Boone. They've been there for years, and that's helped them survive during the pandemic, but they've still had to work at it. We try and do a lot of the, you know, the hands-on grassroots type marketing and a lot of local advertising just so people know that we're still here. We were amazed and I guess overwhelmed and so thrilled with the, the local support. Support these local watering holes need to survive. And thankfully, even for Tracy, things could be looking up. Business is picking back up lately. Most restaurants don't expect a return to normal anytime soon. According to the Iowa Restaurant Association, 36% of restaurant owners think it will be 6 to 12 months before business return to pre-pandemic levels. Reporting in studio, Ryan Scott, Local 5 News, We Are Iowa. It was a scene all too familiar to families across the country. Adults who moved away from home years ago to live in big cities like New York and San Francisco, moving back into their parents' basements. Local 5's Sabrina Ahmed spoke to one couple in Des Moines who the, they were thankful they had that option. This story hits especially close to home to me because it happened to my best friend. She and her fiance moved into her childhood home and that sparked a whole host of life changes for her. Pre-pandemic, I was working as a corporate lawyer in Manhattan uh, and early March actually packed a bag for a one week vacation with my family. And while in San Diego, Brittany Brody and her family watched as the world shut down. It escalated really quickly. I actually have a very vivid memory of us the last time we dined inside a restaurant and masks were not a thing at that point. Her home, New York City, was the spot for the first COVID case, and cases had likely been silently spreading for days or weeks there. So going back wasn't an option. Um, you know, being in Manhattan was unnerving. They decided to head back to Des Moines with her parents. Um, put us in a much more grounded place. You know, my fiance and I were fortunate we were able to work remotely. Thinking this would be a short-term thing. And, you know, six days turned into six months and we ultimately ended up staying there for a very long time. They even bought a dog. As a grown woman preparing to marry the love of her life, living in her parents' basement isn't exactly what they pictured. Going from full independence, living in Manhattan, being an attorney, going to work, basically not having to answer to anyone for any of my decisions, to asking my mom what time dinner was going to be was certainly an adjustment. But it was time for Brittany and Sam. They never thought they would get. I hadn't lived home in so long. Um, I'm very, very close with my family, so that was a, a silver lining. To I would be lying if I said my fiance wasn't a little excited when we just decided to make our move to Boston, which was where we are now. Although we do love my parents and we miss them very much. <laughs> the changes didn't stop there. Brittany and Sam should be married right now, but they've rescheduled multiple times. We just don't want anyone to not come celebrate our day with us because they're nervous, because they feel uncomfortable. And while that could be devastating for her, Brittany has decided to count her blessings instead. A, a wedding is just a wedding, and there are so many more important, meaningful things happening in the world. When the pandemic began and we all scattered to our homes, there was a lot of unknown. It was so overwhelming. It still often is. Good news was scarce. So anchor Stephanie Angelson decided to go looking for that good news. From that idea, our nightly segment called Happy Moments was born. And Local 5's Stephanie takes a look back. Those little glimmers of hope that we all shared with one another to remember that there is always good in the world. From the magnificent to the nearly microscopic, Iowans, we sought out the beauty in everyday life and passed it on. We found new ways to celebrate each other and looked after our most vulnerable, even if that meant we had to touch hands through window panes or get even more clever just to say hi. We proved that love will always find a way, even when we didn't know where this path would take us. We drew on sidewalks for passers-by. We made sure our everyday heroes knew they weren't alone. We wrote notes. We slowed down. We found the joy in time spent with those we love the most. 
Nature never failed us, and on those dark days, some time outside could really clear the mind. It hasn't been easy, and we have lost much. But not our sense of humor, our heart, our gratitude. In those snapshots of mundane life and the extraordinary, we are reminded that happiness is in the moment. It's there waiting for us to grab it and share it. So thank you for giving us our happy moments. Well, keep those moments coming. We want to hear from you. What are some of those happy moments that stuck out most to you during the pandemic? Go ahead and text us those photos and videos. We'll create a new happy moments piece by the end of this week.